This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Mississippi Education Connection. I'm your host, Michelle McAdoo, along with my co-host, Tara Wren, Director of Education here at MPB. Well, summer provides a great opportunity to be a, together and active as a family. And finding things to do in Mississippi is not as hard as you may think. So today we're taking a look at a few outdoor attractions that you can enjoy with your family. We'll start in Flora, Mississippi, at the Mississippi Petrified Forest. Then we'll take a closer look at our wonderful Mississippi State Parks with Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Department. Plus, we want to hear from you. We want you to give us a call and tell us about your favorite family fun spots in Mississippi. Now, the number to call is 1-877-672-7464. Well, good morning, Tara. Good morning. How are you today, Michelle? I am happy. It's Friday. It's been a rainy week. Yes. But um, But it's Friday. You have had an (laughs) interesting week. Well, we've had a fun week. And as we've been talking about here on the show, Summer Learning Family Fun Week, well, we are in the midst of it. We are rounding out, ending tomorrow. But it's oh, it's a- ending tomorrow. Yes. So today. We've been going since Sunday. Right. Yes. So give us a little rundown. I love to hear um, the update of what's been going on and the um, fun things that you guys have been doing. Well, yeah, the event goes through tomorrow. Like I said, it's been a lot of fun and engaging with families all week long. Each day we started with the live stream on our MPB Education, MPB Online, MPB YouTube, MPB Twitter at 1045 every day. That's a lot of um, entities. Yes. We, so wow. we meet people where they are in, at, their, in their favorite, <clears throat> um, at their favorite social media media and uh, or platform. So all week long, we've ha- we have a family to start the day off with us. We have our own Jermaine Flood, who is a, the host for the week, and she's doing a fabulous job. Then we have a host family. That we reached out to, and they kind of demonstrate the activity of the, day, of the day because we have an activity for families to do together at mm-hmm. home, and they're learning together. And we just um, got a family, and they do the the, um, the, sh- the activity on mm-hmm. on the they live stream. It, they right? demonstrate it. They demonstrate it. Thank okay. you. I lost my <laughs> no, words. <it's> okay. <laughs> yeah. So they demonstrate it, and that's been fun seeing how different families will um, demonstrate the activity. Okay. And we have families to write in or send in their entries. So you can see some of those on our website. And every day there's a random drawing of those who submit theirs and we send them a family prize. So oh, wow. that's been a lot of fun as well. So, but it's all week long. It ends tomorrow. Um, thousands have tuned in to the wow. live streams every day. If anyone missed the previous days, they can go back and watch it at um, MPB Online. Education.mpbonline.org. And it's starting today at 1045, and that's during the show. So we'll give them a little bye, yeah. let them go, and, <laughs> and, and encourage folks to go over and to get started watching. So, And we're looking forward to a cool art workshop. Tamara Yolandi Van Herden from Greenwood, Mississippi. She's an artist who believes in, in recycled materials, making art from recycled materials. Good for the environment. It's going to, we're going to cre- learn to create a diary from tissue paper rolls. Wow. So that's going to be interesting. So all the information is online at education.mpbonline. You know what? You mentioned that you were not shocked, but pleasantly pleased at how many people tuned in. Yes, we didn't have a benchmark. Mm -hmm. You know, this is our first time doing a virtual event, so we didn't have anything to measure it by. But, you know, we, like I said, we've had thousands of views every day across the, the um, platforms that we've live streamed on. And just our engagement, the comments and the feedback that we're getting, it's been very um, pleasing. And we're, we're, we're happy with the results that we. So it, it has taught us something. We've learned some things and we'll definitely be doing more of this virtual learning. And, I, and that's a point to make um, with COVID-19 and the pandemic still happening in um, the world today. We've had to adapt, and I love how your department has come up with these ideas to continue the fun learning, but you do it a different way. Absolutely. We've created a a web page, several web pages for summer learning resources, and this Summer Learning Family Fun Week 
particular, all these activities are on there. So, yes, people can go back. And these are things you can do over and over in different ways. So what's next for the education department? (laughs) Well, we're working on the next project, which is called Teacher Features. It's a project where both formal and informal teachers can send in their short videos where they're teaching us something in five minutes or less. And we're looking to receive some very interesting videos. We've already received some from how to do various things in a garden, how to plant your garden, how to dig a hole and water the seeds and all that. And we've also how to make a mask. So teachers, we're looking to receive videos from them. We're taking submissions right now. We've extended that deadline to July the 3rd, and we're going to start posting them on our MPB Education uh, Facebook page on July 7th. So teachers... If you're out there and you're listening, if you have ideas to help other teachers learn how to teach on digital platforms, submit your submissions by July 3rd to what's the website again? It's education.mpbonline.org. Where we're going to take our first break. When we get back, we're going to head to the Mississippi Petrified Forest with our guest, Lynn Evans. So stay tuned. This is Mississippi Education Connection on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center and host of Southern Remedies Relatively Speaking. Join us as we explore issues that relate to you and your family, from mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life disruptions. Whatever the issue, let's try to figure it out together. You can listen live Tuesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Good morning, and you're listening to Mississippi Education Connection. I'm your host, Michelle McAdoo, along with my co-host, Tara Wren, Director of Education here at MPB. And today, we're taking a look at places you can take your family for some summer family fun. Well, our first attraction offers a unique glimpse into our history. And here to tell us more about this amazing place is the oldest of the family that founded the Mississippi Petrified Force, Miss Lynn Evans. Good morning, Lynn. Well, good morning. How are you, Michelle? I am doing wonderful. How are you? I'm doing great as well. Now, I would like you to pronounce that last name. My maiden name was Shabillion, spelled S-C-H-A-B-I-L-I-O-N. It heralded from Alsace-Lorraine and was actually pronounced Shabillion. When we when the uh, my relatives came to the country, there were many Germans in the family, and their language is uh, not as fluid as the French is. So it it got gutturalized by one of my great grandmothers into Shabillion, <laughs> and uh, so it's uh, of course in school as I was coming up, I would when roll call was called when the, she just said shh. Sh, sh, Lynch, whatever, I'd raise my hand because I knew that had to be my name. Tell us a little bit about how you are connected to the Petrified Force. Well, actually, um, we our family moved from Arizona to the Delta in 1954. Uh, I had uh, two other sisters and one other brother, and our parents were just uh, hell-bent on us learning and enjoying and uh, <clears throat> with wide, eyes wide open. <clears throat> so when we moved, they wanted to show us our new state, that there were things here. They had been looking for something interesting to see. They found an old Texaco road map 
which had noted on it a petrified forest near the capital of Jackson. So we took out um, off on a Sunday to see if we could locate it. Uh, We did, just south of a small town called Flora, about 15 to 20 miles from um, the state capital. It was located on a dirt road, which at that time had no name. Now it bears the name of Petrified Forest Road. And uh, uh, we walked across through down half down fences across the deserted pasture into the woods, and we were amazed. There were a great number of large logs lying beneath the longleaf pines and among the badly eroded hills. Erosion was what caused these fossils to be seen. The, this was a historic log jam um, of a predecessor of the Mississippi River where the logs had been deposited. And uh, what causes petrifaction is the fact that it has to be preserved from oxygen. And so uh, these were all buried like in a sandbar or a log jam or something like that. And they, uh, as the river passed over, it kept depositing um, sediment on top of these logs. And these logs came from way up north of Canada originally. And um, once they became buried, that gave them the opportunity to be petrified. Not everything that gets buried gets petrified, but protected from the oxygen and, and right there with the groundwaters flowing with silica and other minerals uh, as, as the uh, cell structure of the trees uh, disintegrated, the cell structure of the fossil was turned into a tree. I mean, was turned into a rock. And uh, it's quite heavy replacement. A square foot of a petrified log weighs 160 pounds wow. so that is it, it's turned from wood to actually to log and what it is so unique is that it's done cell by cell so that even the rings on the logs or bark or or broken branches and so forth are are easily detectable even you know do you know they're not just a rock there's something about them and they have the wood grain and so forth and so um, we had found the previous owner, Mr. Black, who he was, uh, he was very interested. He owned this property, and he was very interested in people knowing about it. But because of his age and his health, um, uh, he ended up selling it to my parents, who I think host, uh, who, uh, who uh, I think hocked everything they had. <laughs> to to come up with the money to actually preserve this, both my parents, Bob Chevillian and Cheryl Chevillian, were or were pres- preservationists, and this is their their project in Mississippi, um, and uh, they have other properties in different states for, for you know protecting other things because we noticed that a lot of the logs at that time had names etched in them and they were broken or fresh broken off places like somebody had brought a, uh, a sledgehammer or something in there and gotten a souvenir to put in their rock garden or whatever. And so it was well on its way to being destroyed when um, our parents uh, took it on as a project to try to buy it. Well, they were able to buy it, and in 1962, we moved from the Delta uh, to Flora to start the petrified forest. Well, um, Mississippi is not particularly noted back then for uh, tourist attraction, or things to see or do, and so it was it was really necessary for it to be preserved. Well, in 1966, Stuart Udall, who was the Secretary of the Interior was um, very prominent in getting it, the Mississippi Petrified Forest, registered under the federal government as a natural, natural, national, natural, historical 
uh, uh, event. And we, on the front porch of the museum, as you go in, you'll see that log with that bronze plaque on the uh, on it. Uh, so we, what that means, people say, well, what does that mean? It, it just means that we are protected by, the land is protected by the federal government, and people are not, uh, and, and the place will never be um, made into a, a goofy golf or a, something like that. It, it is being preserved as a natural historical site. And uh, so anyway, and uh, that was a, a big, big day in the, in, in the day of, of uh, the forest because it was not well known. And it was, uh, I mean, it was just, it, we were just getting started. You know, I was the oldest child, and I had a driver's license. So I was sent uh, to the um, huge metropolis next door of Flora, not. Uh, and uh, they did have a drugstore there, and they did have the tissue paper that I was looking for, crepe paper. Crepe paper used to be in use. It's kind of a stretchy paper, and it was used on, for parade floats and all kinds of stuff. Well, believe it or not, in the in the Flora drugstore at that time, um, they actually had some. I don't think it was the colors I wanted, but it didn't really matter because as it hangs out in the weather, it turns white anyway. It loses all of its color. So we marked the trail what the, uh, with these paper ties and did it several times, oh, no, this is a better place for the trail to go. And the trail actually is about uh, a little over six blocks long and um, is now, uh, the most of the trail is paved. Uh, it, it, it had to be paved because it, this is a very sandy loam area, and every time it rains, it just uh, washes away another layer of that soil that that actually hid these logs, and uh, it was just getting, well, it was full of gullies, and, and uh, but anyway, so the family, our family bought two kind of Jim Walter, you know, pre-built houses, kind of, and uh, they were actually a company called Compton Builders in West Jackson, and we bought their sample houses. And we moved them out to the Petrified Forest, where the entrance is now. And uh, one, of the ho- one of the little houses became our place of abode. And then there was a place between the two houses that was uh, left wide open for a future cutting shop and stuff like that. And the other little building became the museum. Uh, actually, uh, uh, when you have children, uh, you can r- certainly... Install, instill in them awe of of natural things or phenomena around you, and our parents had done that even when we lived in Arizona as very small children. We would go out on the desert and so forth and try to find things like chrysocolla, which is a bright turquoise stone, and things like that. Well, my father had been collecting rocks his whole life, and mother, of course, joined him, and so we had a wonderful collection which has been added to numerous times uh, in the museum. Actually, it's, I'm very, very proud of our museum. It, it's a small museum, but it shows so many things about petrifaction and, uh, and other unusual things. And uh, so anyway, um, when we got to walking through the woods, it was very... I remember getting scratched by the blackberry bushes and and uh, little wild plum trees and and uh, just you know it was just overgrown and just but you you would you would fight your way from one log to the other and uh, we uh, we were very excited about it because you could tell these were not just ordinary rocks plain old rocks these were actual fossils. And uh, many years later, um, the petrified wood uh, was uh, was named as the state stone. It is actually a stone, but why wouldn't it be a fossil? Well, because a few years before, 
they had discovered along the Yazoo uh, River um, these bones of this whale-like creature, very long, eel-kind-of-shaped thing with many, many teeth. It was a basilosaurus. We did not have any uh, actual dinosaur dinosaurs in Mississippi because all of this was underwater during the time that the fossils uh, of the dinosaurs were being done. So we ended up with the, with the petrified forest. Miss Lynn, I love that story. That is wonderful. I love how you told us about your parents and how they came to Mississippi and they uh, started with your family. And it's just right now, it's a national natural landmark. And it started in 1965. Love that story. You did mention your museum and your trails. You guys have campgrounds as well. You have a pavilion now and a gift shop. Those those um, gems and things that you were talking about that y- your family gathered and um, saved over the years, those gems are um, on display in your museum, and people can actually buy unique and unusual gems and mineral items from around the world in your gift shop, correct? That is correct. That's You, you couldn't have said it better. Uh, <laughs> That's but, wonderful. Uh, we had help with our museum. A lot of people had had feelings for the, what we were trying to do for Mississippi was to, to save this and um, from being hauled away like rock garden rocks and stuff. And so when we started the museum, uh, several people that were interested in it also donated things that we would of interest that we put in there. And so um, we, we, uh, uh, we do have the uh, pavilion, uh, which can be reserved for large groups, or it's uh, if it's not in use that day, your family can get it under, under those. We've got a lot of picnic tables and so forth, and it makes a really good, fun family thing. That is wonderful, exactly what we're talking about today, family fun spots around Mississippi. Now, someone interested in collecting rocks might find a visit to the park quite interesting. Can you give us a little um, um, inside look at the gem mining flume oh, and yeah. what that is about? Yeah, well, I mentioned that my our folks had done some other types of uh, preservation, too. Uh, uh, one of the things we have is in North Carolina in a town called Little Switzerland, we have, uh, the family owns several mines there that have been preserved. The mines, when they are mined out, generally are let fill up with water or or just, you know. But he he was, my father again and mother both were interested in preserving the history of the mines and the mining people of the Blue Ridge. And so they bought a uh, an abandoned mine, which was actually the original Bonami mine, and it was mined primarily for the feldspar that went into the Bonami products. But there are so many wonderful stories, and so that was another thing they had started was was uh, to to save this mining heritage. <laughs> and one of the things that people like to do when they go to these old mines is to flume. Uh, in other words, you put some loose rocks in your screen and you have running water there from the lake and, and uh, you, you shake it and get the dirt out and save the good fun pieces. And that is what a flume is. And we borrowed that from, from the uh, Emerald Village in Little Switzerland, North Carolina, our preservation. I love that. And so actually kids and groups and families can come and that you let them actually flume and the kids can actually leave with a bag. You call it a mine muck bag of right. gemstones to keep. That is so neat. I'm sure the school um, groups love that. Um, speaking of schools, what are the educational aspects of um, the museum? Well, the actual um, forest and um um, what do the kids learn? What can they learn when they come there? About well, we hope they learn a lot. And one number one would be pride in their state, because actually you misspoke. 
when you said it was the there was two petrified forests east of the Mississippi, this is only the one that survived. Mm. What happened is the settlers came in and they found these rocks of different sizes in different states. Uh, they used them as building blocks for chimneys, house foundations, uh, and and the other forests just disappeared over time, which was what was happening to this. But because of its isolated uh, nature and not many people knew about it, it didn't get scarfed up like the other petrified forests did. Now almost all there are petrified forests still in Washington State, and of course Arizona is the big big one that's famous. And um, so, um, but it, our folks always thought that things should be done together as a family. A thing and. and I mean, I have seen everything from the world's largest ball of twine to all kinds of stuff because the, the folks drug us along. And it was always a family thing. And with children, I love working with children, and uh, especially young children, third or fourth grade. They are just wide-eyed and just in awe of things. You know, uh, when you show them a bone of a camel, which came from Mississippi, that's one of the things in our, well, well what, where are the camels, you know, this sort of stuff. We don't have any dinosaur dinosaurs, but we do have fossil mammals, like many fossils of big whales and things like that. And in our museum, uh, we've got huge teeth from these fossils that we have located. And but one of the best fossils in our museum is the uh, is Ugly Betty. Now... Uh, most kids are really, uh, when you talk about elephants roaming around in the delta and, and here and there, it, it, the mammals came after the whales. But, yes, uh, this ugly Betty was a mastodon, and they lived on brush, and it was an elephant, and elephant type. And then the ones that people think of when we mention mastodon is the mammoth. And that's the pretty one with the very long curved, uh, the elephant with the long curved uh, tusks and so forth. And that's a, that's a confusion because they they lived on the grasses, on the plant, uh, on the in the area, and the mastodons ended up eating small trees and brush and so forth. And is in their teeth, <coughs> and you can see that in the museum. We have one that was found nine miles from our front door of the museum. We were so excited. Um, it was a lady that was building a, um, excuse me, let me get a little water here. Uh, she was building a catfish pond. Miss uh, Lynn, I love these stories. This is so much great information and so much history about the uh, Mississippi Petrified Forest. But, um, Tara, I know you had a question about uh, social distancing yes, in, uh, since the pandemic. You're talking a, a lot about families, and that's what this show is about, families and learning and education and learning together. You talked about the tours. And um, what if a family want to co- wants to come to the Petrified Forest now and take a day there to visit what types of social distancing guidelines okay. and safety guidelines um, do you all have in place for families? Well, we have been, uh, we have just recently reopened and uh, due to the COVID-19. And they do request that you wear a mask uh, in the museum and in the gift shop. Now, the trail is, of course, wide open outside, and all you do is... Uh, keep your social distancing and so forth. And um, But uh, if it's done as a family thing, it's such a, it's such a wonderful place to go and wonderful things to see. And um, we used to give hand tours. We had so few tourists that we as kids would give hand tours through the – and I still love to do that because I will point out things – that maybe people wouldn't notice otherwise or, or whatever, you know. But now they're a self-guided trail, and you, you get a trail guide, and it's got, um, it's, it starts with the number one, and then you go all the way to the end and, and back up in the museum. 
and it display it tells you about each it, it, it's a learning thing you know so um that is wonderful. Now, uh, do ind- individuals, especially now during the pandemic, do individuals need to make reservations to come or they can actually just come? Because you are open year round. And that was something interesting I did not know. You're not closed or just open during the summer. You're open year round except Thanksgiving and Christmas Day. Right. That is right. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, it was a hard way to make a living. I know that. Uh, but but in a state that was not known for its uh, tourism. Uh, and, uh, of course, when we moved from Arizona, the uh, one of the first places the folks took us was to the military park over in Vicksburg. And so, uh, the, I think there are a lot of parents that want their children to see and have and get information uh, other than just through the public schools or private schools or whatever. They want they want them to live and feel and find and and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, one of uh, Bob's uh, see she's my great grandchild, so he would be his great grandchild is in state. She'll be a senior this year, and her name is Lita. And Lita, uh, well, the whole family kind of revolved around funny rocks and stuff. So she would sit in the playground that was covered with pea gravel at the school. And she would collect little crinoids, which are animals that are rooted to the... And and she ended up with a collection of about 400 of them. So she was so fascinated with these little fossils that, of course, then uh, we would take her to, like, the rock show that's held in February uh, by the Gem and Lapidary, uh, Gem and Mineral Society of Mississippi. And... uh, so she grew. Now she is in college. Will be a senior this year. She is majoring in uh, geology, and uh, you have to take these right. opportunities. It also causes the family to be bonded when they do these things together. You're right. You are correct. And you said a mouthful right there. So a lot of parents, you're listening to the show, take your kids out to the Mississippi Petrified Forest and different places around the state because we have beautiful places here in Mississippi. Thank you, Lynn Evans. You are living history. Uh, Thank you for telling us about the Mississippi Petrified Forest. Well, it's time for us to take our final break and we will return. We'll welcome the Mississippi Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Department to tell us about all of the wonderful state parks we have here in Mississippi. And don't forget, if you'd like to tell us about your favorite family fun attraction, give us a call at 1-877-672-7464. Stay tuned. This is Mississippi Education Connection on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Mississippi Education Connection on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Michelle McAdoo, along with my co-host, Tara Wren, Director of Education here at MPB. Well, if you're just joining us today, we're featuring summer family fun destinations around Mississippi. Now, before the break, we spoke with Lynn Evans about the Mississippi Petrified Forest. And, Tara, we learned a lot about the Mississippi and the history (laughs) of the Mississippi Petrified Forest. And if you want to know more or want to take your family, just log on to uh, Mississippi Petrified Forest online and you can see all about the forest. Now let's take a closer look at our Mississippi State Parks with State Park Administrator Stu Rayburn. Good morning. Good morning, Michelle. Good to be with you. Thanks for spending a little time with us. I know you're quite busy right now. Summer um, just started picking up and people are probably coming to your parks. Yeah, we're uh, open a little bit late because of the COVID-19. We opened really just before uh, the Memorial Day weekend, and Memorial Day weekend is sort of the kickoff of the summer. So we were 
extremely busy. Unfortunately, we didn't have the water park at that time ready, but uh, the water park is now open. So we're really wide open, full go, um, uh, even with the pandemic kind of looming over our shoulder. Um, people are just ready to get back to some normalcy and uh, be safe about it. But yeah, we're, we are very busy and, um, uh, right on the, right on the cuff of the 4th of July weekend coming up next week. Stu, you mentioned that people are ready to get back and we're still in the, in the middle of the pandemic. The numbers are going up. You've opened a water park. There's a lot of things to consider, a lot of challenges here. Just talk a little bit about the safety uh, precautions that you have put in in in, uh, in place for your visitors and how are you going to they're going to be able to practice social distancing at the water park and other places there in different parks well you know up to this point i you 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 see the 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 same kind of information we see that there's spikes in different states and different locations i think it varies not a one size fits all so I mean, we've uh, since we, since we opened June 18th, uh, our people have been very good. I mean, they understand uh, the, what, what the CDC's recommendations are as far as social distancing and the guidelines. Uh, so, you know, we were prepared for that. We've we've, uh, we've made every effort we could to follow those guidelines uh, put out by the governor's office and the CDC um, to to monitor social distancing. We've uh, to protect our employees and, and our visitors alike has been our most important goal, and, and I feel up to this point, being open since Memorial Day, we're, we're doing doing very well with meeting those goals. And it falls back to the customer. I think the customers are, are all eager to get out, but they understand the circumstances around it, and um, I think they can see that we've taken the necessary precautions to protect uh, both us and the visitors and to keep us all healthy. So we're very pleased with how it's proceeding. We've of course, if you come to the park, you'll see that we we, we have some of our operations have been modified. Um, you know, we don't allow any gatherings of 20 or more uh, throughout the, the picnic area. Our campsites are limited to eight people per site. Um, our water park has a capacity limit, and, uh, so we we'll you'll see once you get inside there that some of the services have been modified. We've reduced our menu to to create shorter lines. Um, we've created you know, markers to keep people separated. So up to this point, I think people are really co- uh, cooperating and they recognize what's what's uh, happening now and, and the potential for, you know, things to, to change. So we're, we're, we're excited about where we're at today and, and looking forward, and we'll continue to take the necessary steps every day to, to ensure that, that, that we're all safe and healthy. And now, Stu, we actually jumped right in and talking about the park, and I noticed that we never mentioned the name of the park we we're talking about. You have been with uh, the parks department for 30 years, and you are actually, um, you oversee the Buccaneer State Park in Waveland, Mississippi, which ex- actually is the number one park in Mississippi. Um, tell us how many parks there are in the state, and can you just give us a brief overlook of what each park, the amenities of the parks? Well, yeah, there's 26 state parks, um, and we're stretched out from basically the Tennessee line to the Gulf of Mexico. And um, being around the state park system for as long as I have, you know, I've got a very proud tradition of of Rayburn serving in Mississippi State Parks. My dad served 28 years from 1972 to 2000. My sister was also in park management administration for, for 30 years. And wow. so we've got almost a century of Rayburns um, working in state parks. I'm very proud of that. and have learned a lot from my dad on, you know, how to, how to represent the park in, in the right way. And so, but our parks are so diverse, Michelle. I mean, you know, going all the way up to J.P. Coleman, that's sort of a mountainous area, and on, on Pickwick Lake, it's, they're just so unique. There's a lot of history spread out uh, from some of these parks, from the, the CCC built cabins to, you know, one of us. Buccaneers, one of the, the more recent. Uh, we opened in '76, uh, so the parks uh, got almost full, almost 50, close to 50 years of operation, but. Uh, so diverse, a lot of a lot of recreational opportunities offered, um, from picnicking to horseback riding to uh, ATV trails, a lot of great lakes for fishing. Um, 
you know, our cabins for overnight lodging. You know, we have motels and villas. Uh, we have golf courses spread out, uh, four golf courses, four golf courses from from Panola County all the way down to, to Pike County. So um, there's a lot to do and see in state parks. And of course, us, uh, meaning Buccaneer, we're on the Gulf Coast. We're we're 45 minutes from New Orleans, so we're in a we're in a fantastic location. Um, surrounded by you know, the beautiful Gulf of Mexico and a lot of opportunities, not only here, um, but along the Gulf Coast. So we're, we're just in a great location. And uh, if someone, a uh, Mississippian or someone from out of state is looking for something to do, Mississippi State Parks has got just about everything that, that, that a family can, can want or are seeking in their vacation. Yeah, uh, Stu, you know, you mentioned uh, the amenities and the differences at the parks. One of your parks, Clark Creek State Park in Woodville, Mississippi, has beautiful waterfalls. And you don't see waterfalls in Mississippi often. Um, but it's, Absolutely. Yeah, but it's currently closed right now, correct? Right, it is. Okay. Due to COVID-19, um, do will are, are there any plans on opening that park this summer? There is. Um, you know, as the governor laid out uh, sort of our reopening plan and phases, um, there's plans as we proceed. You know, things change daily. Um, and so, you know, our agency, Dr. Polis and, and our administrators are closely monitoring um, county by county, um, city by city uh, to see what the conditions are. So we, we hope that we'll, we'll eventually get to where that park can reopen. Well, Stu, can you talk a little bit about how the state parks play a key role in the preservation of wildlife, endangered species, and certain plants and trees? Well, you know, state parks, you know, our biologists and, and, and the agency kind of focuses on um, that that aspect of it. In state parks, um, in my field as administrator, we, we're really focused on, you know, um, the, the visitor and the visitor's experience to our cabins and overnight lodging and, and day use type uh, traffic. Uh, as an administrator, we also uh, have land management, timber management, and several of our parks have uh, large lakes with levee systems and dams and spillways. So that's what I mean. The diversity from from our state parks, from uh, from J.P. Coleman uh, near the Tennessee line to Clarko that's near the Alabama line. Um, and, and down here to the Gulf Coast, where you know, we have uh, a, a unique environment and setting of indigenous plants and animals. Um, so every every park has their own sort of dynamics and how they manage um, each each individual property. So your parks do are a good learning spaces, um, based on what you're saying. Lots of information about various parts of nature and. So can you talk a little bit or share what you think the best thing about the park or point one out, the best learning uh, education that someone can get when they come there? Well, I, I think, you know, we, we offer that, that back to nature sort of feel. Um, you know, when, when I was a kid, we, we were those kids that kind of played the mud puddles all the time. Well, technology has now kind of lured kids into their room with the PlayStations. And so... You know, our, our, our viewpoint is this, how do we get the family back together? The good family values that we shared uh, years ago of, of just uh, the simplicity of going to a state park and renting a cabin that overlooks a lake and maybe going out with your kids and fishing. Um, it just kind of puts you back to nature, maybe the, the old way of, of uh, a way civilization was before the technology and advanced technology took over. So, um, it's just, I, I, I think, from what we hear from our, our, our guests, really feel that, you know, State Parks is an affordable place for vacation uh, that allows you to get back to a park, maybe turn the cell phones off and the TV mm-hmm. and just spend good quality family time. And, and from what we hear from our customers, that they feel safe. They feel like their kids can can get out on their bike uh, and, and ride safely throughout the park or play on a playground or take a hike down a nature trail. And so it's just getting back to good, solid family fun in, in a great um, state park, which we have that to offer from from, uh, 
from the Tennessee line to the Gulf of Mexico. I love it. And you said a mouthful right there, and that's what we're talking about today. <laughs> Family fun in Mississippi. Mississippi is a gem. We have so many unique places here, and you guys need to get out there and see what Mississippi has to offer. Now, where uh, where can people find out more information about our vast state parks in Mississippi? Uh, well, they can, they can visit our website at mbwfp.com. Um, you can make a reservation um, uh, two years in advance to, to most of our cabins. Of course, there, we, have, we do have some uh, restrictions because of the COVID-19 as far as um, um, renting the cabins. Uh, so you'd have to contact each individual park. But on our website, there's a link that will take you to any one of our Mississippi State Parks, and we'll provide the information, contact number for those parks. So if, you're, if you got some questions about uh, you know, fishing mm-hmm. or renting a cabin or visiting the park uh, on a day use type um, experience, um, our website, mdwfp.com, is the place to go. Wonderful. Thank you, Stu Rayburn, and thank your family, the Rayburn legends with the state parks. Thank you for being a part of Mississippi <laughs> Education today. You have a great day and be safe, okay? Michelle, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Well, we've come to the end of another great show. We want to thank our listeners for joining us today and thank our guest, Lynn Evans, with the Mississippi Petrified Forest and from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, State Park Administrator Stu Rayburn. Well, Mississippi Education Connection is a production of MPB Think Radio in conjunction with MPB's Education Services Department and the Mississippi Department of Education. For Tara Wren, I'm Michelle McAdoo. Stay tuned for Southern Remedy for Women and join us next Friday at 10 a.m. for more Mississippi.